All right, everybody, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are in Age of Wonders 4 in our multiplayer basic series. And today we're gonna to be talking about our signature skills tier list. Now, before we dive in, I do wanna frame this. This is geared towards multiplayer, but even if you're doing single player, don't think this won't be useful to you. It's just geared more towards players who are gonna be doing auto-resolve only against the AI or auto-resolve mostly against the AI, because that is the way that things work in multiplayer. So with that uh, out of the way, let's also talk a little bit about the bookkeeping here unfortunately for you and for me um the encyclopedia really doesn't have a lot of great information in fact it has literally no information on signature skills and very little information on heroes generally so rather than being able to navigate through all of this information in game we are going to have to navigate using the uh, the database i'll try to remember to put a link to this in the description for this video um but basically if you want to learn more about signature skills your best bet is to use this you can just like use debug mode and and get a bunch of level 20 heroes really quickly and then see all the different uh, the different abilities and ways to test them in game if that's the way that you like to test stuff. But I do think that if you're good at, at reading what's going on in the signature skills and understanding the context in which you're looking at these signature skills, you can do a very good job of, of doing an evaluation even without having seen the skill in action. Um, now that said, before we jump in on our, our grading criteria and actually throwing these guys down on the board, I think we do need to have a big conversation about the context in which you need to be evaluating signature skills because the context is so so different depending on what type of hero you're going to be putting it on if you're putting it on a generic hero versus a ruler versus a dragon ruler both the way that you're going to take these skills as well as the impact of taking the skills is going to be completely different so let's talk about that context real fast so let's begin by just discussing a general case when it comes to heroes. So generally what happens is that every fourth level you're gonna unlock another signature skill. The signature skill is gonna give you one new signature skill point, that's the thing along the top when inside your hero bar, um, and then you can spend that to pick one of six different skills. Those skills are, are gonna be randomly assorted from the different affinities, you're gonna see one of each different affinity type. If you choose that skill in question, then it's going to add that affinity to your hero as a governor that's going to give you a slight modification to the income in that city on your usual like generic run-of-the-mill heroes th that's where the affinity stops it's not going to be giving you anything on your empire however as a as an addendum for the specific case of rulers any affinity that you choose on your signature skills also applies to your empire. So this is a very important cleavage already inside the video. We can assess things kind of on both dimensions simultaneously, and that's what we're gonna be trying to do today. But do understand that whenever it comes to how you evaluate signature skills, when you evaluate them on your hero side, don't think about the affinity very much. The affinity, in fact, basically does not matter at all whenever it comes to what you're choosing for your heroes. Conversely, what you choose on your ruler, because of its impact, on your ability to choose stuff in your empire tree as well as on your tomes sometimes the affinity is literally the only thing that matters so the uh, the evaluation here whenever it comes to our tier is going to be pretty complicated and that is going to make the discussions on some of these things a little longer in order to help make them sort of like useful still i think what we're going to do is we're going to break them in, into groups so that way we can discuss like all of the astral things together all of the dragon things together um and then those groups will hopefully give us a little more guidance but there really is like a lot of complicated uh nuance whenever it comes to the application of and the utilization of signature skills now i do want to highlight that there are two really important consequences of the affinity for your signature skill on your ruler applying to your empire the first of course is that you can use your signature skills at the beginning of the game to heavily supplement your access to like core empire things on the empire tree uh very very powerful pieces of the empire tree remain materium one astral two and shadow one i think for most builds if you can get access to all three of those you'll really benefit but even if you can just get access to materium one as a core um your economy is just going to be a lot better because being able to build outposts twice as fast with twice as many tiles is making your outposts four times better by like you know fudging some math here and there and doing 
some hand waving. Um, and so like you really don't want to miss out on that. But if you make a build where you're planning on taking alchemy as like your first materium affinity, you can do that, but you're probably not going to take alchemy as your first tome. So then you're saying, all right, well, maybe I'll start getting uh, materium unlocked on like turn 10. And that means that I'll start getting the affinity on turn 11. So I'll have 15 affinity by turn 26. You can't, you can't do that if you're planning on really using Materium 1. You want to get that thing online very, very early. So a way that you can supplement it is you can take your first uh, signature skill as just any Materium, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. And then you start getting the Materium Affinity in until you hit that breakpoint of 15 by the, you know, supplementing it with the alchemy that you've picked up as your, your second tier 1. Um, and then you're not really that far behind someone who just started with one Materium in their build because you get that second materium as a, a nice little benefit for uh, for unlocking your tome. But, you know, that's that's one approach to using it. The more common approach um, whenever it comes to really juicing the affinity side is to use the reset on your ruler. So whenever you reset in Age of Wonders 4, the first time you reset is free. It costs you absolutely no Imperium. So what this means is that if you get to your tier 3 tomes and you really want to get Tome of Devastation but you didn't put any any chaos into your build at all. It doesn't matter, you can still unlock it as long as you have a level 12 ruler. So what you do is you just get to level 12, you have a tier 3 tome unlock, like, waiting for you to resolve, um, and then you just click reset for the, t the first time for free. You go ahead and you just take three uh, chaos signature skill affinities. This gives you three empire affinity for chaos. Then you can choose Tome of Devastation. Then you go down and you click reset again. Now, because you haven't taken any of the rest of the skills, because you don't take any other level ups here, just your signature skills, it should cost 150 Imperium, because that's how many points you assigned. So then you get to reset again and then build a real, you know, normal hero that actually uses the signature skills for something other than just the affinity. But be aware that at different points in time on your ruler, the affinities um, can really be dramatically different in terms of their value. So do assess that as like a, a secondary grade here. That said, I think, um, oh, and of course the dragons, but I guess the dragon stuff we can talk about whenever we do their uh, tier list. And I guess that's a good enough reason to just start with the dragons. So the uh, the dragon ruler traits, let's, uh, let's break those guys down. So before we get into discussing our aspects as well as our transformations for our dragon ruler, the aspect being available at level 4 and the transformation being available at level 12, I think we should talk a little bit about dragon rulers in Age of Wonders 4. So a dragon ruler in Age of Wonders 4 is going to offer you a lot of different things in comparison to a normal, air quotes, normal ruler. Um, the first thing being, of course, that you get an extra affinity. At the beginning of the game, you choose a type of dragon. This type of dragon is going to give you an empire affinity, sort of the same way that a signature skill gives you an extra affinity but in addition to that it's also going to affect the damage type that your your uh, dragon does which in turn is also going to affect the sort of like status that your dragon does with their breath weapon it's also going to affect the aura that the dragon gets at level seven um, all dragons will get access to an aura based off of their basic dragon type you don't look at the aspects or the transformations for any of that um, but the aura is also a very powerful skill sort of like a signature skill in terms of it, the value presented, at least on, on some of the stronger auras it certainly is. Um, and Shadow Dragon does happen to have one of the, the good ones, but Shadow Dragon is not the only playable one. Astral's great against infestations and ancient wonders because lightning damage is good against constructs and ethereal, uh, as well as against like water elementals and guys who are just like randomly transformed by a, via steel skin and the like. So Astral Dragon I think is actually generally better than Shadow Dragon when it comes to clearing ancient wonders. Um, also, part of the problem there is that Shadow Dragons get a lot of their value out of out of exploiting low status resistance out of their enemies. So against high, very powerful enemies, you're going to have some issues actually um, freezing them. Whereas, you know, the, the status that Astral Dragon afflicts is dead, and that's uh, generally harder to avoid with status resistance. Uh, the Order Dragon also afflicts uh, Distracted as part of its breath weapon. So if you're playing around with Tome of Beasts, then this is a really easy way to give your AI 
access to uh, flanking. Like you don't, if you're if you're doing manual combats, you can do whatever you want to. But when it comes to auto resolve, if you're trying to use something like sneaky or tome of beasts or like extra ways to exploit flanking, you can lean on casting that that um, tome of beasts uh, mark as prey, and that can work in the hands of an auto resolve. But AI is just not great at using spells right now, and the breath weapon on the other hand is like consistent. And then of course the spirit damage is also just very good if you anticipate fighting against the undead or fiends or for whatever reason stone spirits i don't know what, what stone spirits did to get lumped in um that bad company but order dragons can be pretty good underground um because you're going to see a lot of those types down there or on desolate terrain and then materium dragons they get access to a special type of scale so uh on your dragon in addition to all of the other goofball things that are a little different you get access to dragon scales most of the dragon scales are going to give you an elemental resistance type um but for materium instead they just get like more defense and resistance across the board so they're just like generically a little burlier but most of the time you are going to be playing with a shadow dragon simply because of its its power when it comes to the clearing we won't assume a shadow dragon whenever it comes to our evaluation here but uh it is going to have to be factored into the way that we evaluate some of these things here because when it comes to our transformations and our aspects these are non-random um, when it comes to the other skills when it like your normal heroes at level four they'll see you know a, a random selection of this affinity and that affinity and that affinity but with a dragon ruler you see all of the aspects because there's only one of each one and you get to choose whichever one you want and because the context here is that you get this at level four you're probably going to be getting this uh aspect unlocked for the first time when you're still on your first tome hopefully um sometimes it can take a little bit longer because you die but you're probably going to do this on your first tome so you need to factor that into the way that you're assessing things like you're not going to have 15 different units with soul bound whenever it comes to getting good value out of the shadow aspect so let's look at our tier list and then we'll talk things through so in the s tier we have the materium aspect and the order transformation let's talk about those two in turn so the material Materium aspect as our first aspect kind of like sets the pace for the other aspects and then and then we'll talk you know about the transformation and then we'll we'll talk about all the other things in turn um, but the materium aspect gives you 30% critical hit chance as well as plus two defense at the beginning of the game one of the most dangerous things as a dragon ruler to see is a stack with two pole arms in it especially like two tier two pole arms that is a nightmare for dragons because in the event that you're playing a shadow dragon like yes if you get a frozen effect on that on that pole arm you're probably fine but now it's a tier two so it has slightly higher status resistance so you're less likely to actually be able to to freeze them um and in the event that they can get close to you as a dragon you're going to be large so you're going to take 40 percent extra damage and those tier twos can can do a lot of work but once you get to Materium Aspect, plus two defense unlocks those fights as being a lot easier. In addition, you also get making those fights a lot easier through the plus 30% critical hit chance. Uh, part of the package for Materium is that this is incredibly, incredibly good in the early game. As the game goes on and you see fewer and fewer single model entities running around, then this plus 30% crit chance isn't going to be as powerful. But at the beginning of the game, if you have a crit, like plus 30% crit chance on your breath weapon and you happen to hit a, you know, a roll on the crit against a, a multi model unit and then you like wipe out another model you saved everybody else on your team a bunch of hp by reducing the damage output on that that enemy unit um and and this is extremely unga bunga and that is like a, a very important thing when it comes to the way you need to assess your signature skills some of the ai behaviors need to be factored into your evaluation if you're thinking about multiplayer and auto resolve because it doesn't understand how to use all of the tools um and things like this where there is no understanding right the materium aspect what does it do well it's a passive that makes you stronger and you don't have to do any kind of work to make that to make that valuable in the hands of the auto resolve in it and it is a lot stronger this is a very big increase on the damage uh, output for your dragon and then of course like you get the materium affinity um and because this is your ruler by definition unless you're playing with uh you know like you're you're letting them in from the outside 
if if you're if you have a goatier like that an ascended dragon and and they're coming in then materium aspect is probably a little bit worse because you're getting it later on into the game and this does slow down as you go on um but i think overall materium affinity is very powerful and the effects there are very powerful and, and i think it deserves a slot in the s and then our celestial transformation just to phrase things for our transformation for us um, the order transformation here gives you the celestial unit type so the celestial unit type is less absolutely critical these days because now you can make a status immunity ring for your dragon you just need a uh, three tranquility pool if i remember correctly in the uh, the the item forge and then you can make a status immunity ring but if you don't have that then um we literally got to see this in a fight uh, mcdara did not have the order transformation on her dragon and she got into a big battle with zombies uh, it, when we were playing around with our uh, undead industrious from like six months ago and zombie used infectious insanity on Amikdara's uh, dragon and then Amikdara's dragon turned around and used its breath weapon on her own army uh, and of course she did not I don't think she won that battle I think that was a, a, a massive defeat for her uh, based off of my memory and and the celestial unit type can prevent that now that said, because the status immunity ring is around, I think that this is something where it really does depend a lot on what your dragon ruler is. Because, um, like, if your dragon ruler is not a shadow dragon, then the ability here for shadow transformation to inflict frozen doesn't have a, a like a stacking penalty. But like, basically, if you are already a shadow dragon, then taking shadow transformation, giving you frozen on your breath weapon and frozen on your breath weapon is not a uh, a match made in heaven. That's one of the big issues with the, this transformation line generally is that like I think a lot of people want to take for flavor reasons they're the same type of transformation when overwhelmingly you usually want to take something different so that way you get more effects on your breath weapon attacks rather than the same thing over and over again and the order transformation breath weapon is i think like the thing that really keeps it in the ass for me right now even though you don't need the celestial unit type in order for a dragon to to be safe anymore it's that this heals all of the friendly units in your breath weapon by 25 temporary hit points and removes negative status defect, uh, effects. So this can remove a lot of different stuns or frozen effects or even that for that matter damage over time effects. I, I really have a very hard time seeing a scenario where order transformation isn't going to be providing incredible amounts of value to you. So those are going to be like our banners when it comes to the uh, the aspects and the transformation. So let's jump back and talk about our aspects. So the remainder of our aspects, we have the Astral Aspect in the A tier. In our B tier, we have the Order Aspect. In the C tier, we have the Shadow and Nature. And in the D tier, we have the Chaos Aspect. Now this is going to reflect both the affinities as well as the abilities for those uh, those aspects. But do keep in mind that because these are non-random, you need like very particular reasons to be picking anything towards the bottom. Um, simply because like you can always take Materium Aspect and that, that massive bonus if you so desire. But Astral Aspect Aspect, I think does have some real applications it is amazingly powerful against some ancient wonders like the uh, the fight against the uh, the gold ancient wonder with the tree and the uh, the horned gods and the entwined scourges I actually had a fight against that in auto resolve only with an, an astral aspect dragon lord that we won on turn 18 I think um, and it was mostly just simply because like the damage output there is almost entirely magical you need to be in a scenario where you see a lot of magic magical damage early, like if you happen to be near a, uh, a, f a fairy pool and you want to fight it as a dragon ruler, then I think you can actually very easily justify taking Astral Aspect there, but you need to see that opportunity to take Astral Aspect first, um, and of course you need to have the uh, the Materium affinity from uh, something else, because um, you don't want to pass up on, on Materium 1 unless you unless you absolutely have to or you're, you're absolutely insane, because unfortunately the Astral Aspect damage is definitely worse than the uh, the materium aspect damage even if the survivability is arguably better it's obviously like a lot worse against pole arms but this thing really does do work against infestations and um and ancient wonders so coughs and astral dragon right there but the uh, attunement fortune increasing hit chance it increases it by giving you stacks of fortune which means that of course this does not stack with fortune unlike the uh, crit chance on materium aspect but also it means that like 
you need the AI to be casting spells, and sometimes the AI just does not do that. Even when you click the, like, allow AI to cast spells in auto-resolve thing, my understanding is that there's a gradation of AI behaviors when it comes to its, its preference to casting spells that's modified in part uh, by how much mana you have just, like, sitting around in your, in your bank and, like, what your mana income is, so that way it won't try to bankrupt you, which is, like, you know, that's cool and all, but it does mean that, like, like, you can't get as much value out of attunement things in auto-resolves um, as you would hope, and then when you get into the manual combats against other people, because hopefully you have other ways of getting fortune, this attunement fortune mostly doesn't do anything. Now, if you don't have other ways of doing fortune, then, like, obviously this does go up in terms of value, but fortune is such a powerful effect that you should probably probably consider having some of it somewhere um because it, it is it is very very strong to get in your entire army um now in the b tier we have the order aspect the order aspect i think is held back primarily by its affinity i do think that order affinity unless you're using it proactively because its empire tree is pretty bad you really only want to be doing it in, in the event that you're thinking about order tomes order tomes are pretty good um but the order empire tree is pretty bad which means that like taking just random affinity there is not as useful um, unless unless you absolutely have to but the order aspect does offer you a lot of value gets you faithful which is cute like that's a little bit of extra income but the biggest the biggest thing you get on order aspect is is plus five status resistance uh, depending on who you're fighting against in manual combats against enemies um, then the plus five status resistance can save you your bacon like just being able to shrug off a lot of different types of frozen and stunned effects on turn 30 in like a team fight can make your dragon move from being like permanently disabled and therefore doing nothing except distracting your opponent's cc to being essentially unstunnable and then for therefore like your opponent just isn't gonna bother right uh, your your opponent is gonna take a 40 percent chance to stun your dragon like all day long um, uh, but are they going to waste their casting slot on an 8% chance of freezing you um, and then the downside of, of like slowing you? Maybe, but probably not. Like the, the That's an evaluation your opponent needs to do. And this makes that math a lot more complicated for them. And then of course, Inflicting Condemned can be pretty good. Uh, minus three status resistance that you can uh, apply with your breath weapon is a very powerful effect. And then of course, this also interacts pretty favorably with zeal. Mostly you don't need zeal and status effects because zeal uh, status effect is dead that it, it it gives you but you know like this means that the order aspect does have some flexibility in, in terms of its application it's mostly just that like it doesn't offer you too much in terms of survivability except against very particular enemies when it comes to auto resolve because most most enemies are not going to be doing most, most, very much damage to you at all um, with their status resistance so it's more for the manual fights than anything else that I give this a, a B tier but it is good in very particular team fights. Nature and Shadow, I just don't think offer you a lot. Shadow doesn't offer you an, a bunch in terms of um, survivability. In fact, it offers you almost nothing. It does offer you 30% extra damage against units with low morale. I see people like rag on this effect a lot whenever it comes to um, the cruel weapons in, in the uh, Tome, Tome of the Doom Herald, but don't think about this as being a, purely a win more. Think about this as being, I'm going to exploit weaknesses in my opponent's formation especially in a fight where your opponent is going to have access to like a, a grade of different types of different tiers of units uh, now these days when a lower tier unit dies it doesn't hurt the morale of a higher tier unit as much and that means that you're way more likely to have fights where like it's 18 versus 18 you get a you get the initial engagement and you manage to kill two or three of their units and then one or two of their units start having low morale problems and then you just get to remove a couple of extra models with the shadow aspect damage um and that's really cute and then the soul bound of course in the event that you have soul binders uh that is going to give you some extra damage but like there's literally no survivability here i think the only thing that you're really excited about is the uh the shadow affinity and then of course in early game fights, you can get randomly very lucky and have the Soulbind give you a decaying zombie in a fight. And getting an extra unit into a fight can make early game clears really messed up. Um, 
but that's more like a, a pseudo heal effect for your army than anything else. Um, and then the nature and the nature aspect, the 20 extra hit points is good for the Draconic Rage because like if you can get your your dragon to be a trap card and people attack it a bunch and push you down into Draconic Rage, then you get to deal 30% extra damage on the, the slap back. But the problem with um, the nature aspect is first you can get like a bunch of HP for dragons elsewhere. So like you more need to be worried about ways to scale up your defense and your resistance simply because dragon rulers have like extremely limited equip slots so they don't have uh, like infinite ways to stack up to 14 defense all the time. Um, and, and you can get like plus 200 extra hit points by just healing. So just make sure your, your HP total and survivability is high enough that like you, you're not gonna die in one round of attacks and then plus 20 hit points just doesn't do anything. And then watchful is good if you have uh, provoke attacks and you can do that now with uh, the new uh, item forge and the ability to build claws for your dragons so that's really cool but like overall the survivability that you get out of nature aspect is a lot worse than the survivability that you get out of materium and uh, an astral and I think the damage that you get is about on par with astral while still being worse than materium and then of course the affinity type is like just a, a across the board a lot worse than the other two so like you, you're just usually not going to need nature aspect uh and then chaos aspect you just like basically never need unless you're role playing plus 10 percent extra damage per negative status effect is cute um but remember that like in very low tier fights yes everyone's gonna have low status effects and so like you're gonna be applying those more often but you're also not gonna have like a diverse cast of of status effects that you can throw on the board um and then you know of course like you hit for 10 percent extra damage once and then 20 percent extra damage once maybe you're getting a, an average of like 15 percent extra damage on your your dragon's attacks that's that's not nothing um but like 50 percent extra morale really doesn't do a lot until you start getting rallies and whatnot which requires you to have at least one other hero at level four or more likely you're gonna need um like some spells and stuff so just like there's there's literally zero survivability here and a very very tiny amount of extra damage thrown on chaos aspect and a very bad uh, affinity type so overall I, I think d tier makes sense for the uh the chaos affinity there so let's now talk about the rest of our transformations all right, so let's talk about our remaining transformations then. So in the A tier, we have the Materium and the Astral transformation. In the B tier, we have the Nature and the Shadow transformation. And in the D tier, we have the Chaos transformation. Now it's not that Chaos and Nature and Shadow are like inherently not very powerful things when it comes to the signature skills. Like it's pretty hard to find something that's better value than a dragon transformation of any type. But ultimately when it comes down to it, because this is a non-random assortment of things, you don't have to take the weak Weaker things unless you really want to um, and you generally don't so just as we discussed with the order transformation you get access to a really great collection of uh, status immunities you also we didn't really highlight this but it transforms your breath weapon to being at least part spirit damage if you're not already an order dragon um, but really crucially it just gives you a giant aoe uh, clear negative status debuffs that is a huge huge thing when it comes to big manual combats but it's also like a really good healing effect for um for auto resolves but another thing that's like really powerful for auto resolves or any sort of stun effect uh, materium has access to a 70 percent chance of inflicting stun it also gives you access to physical damage on your breath weapon one of the things that happens in age of wonders 4 is that at the beginning of the game um magical damage is just like a lot stronger because of like almost all units are not going to have a lot of resistance on turn 15 and then as the game goes on and more people get access to um more elemental damage types you'll need to get more and more resistance and so resistance will generally be scaling up in the background but most of the time people are not scaling up their physical damage as much and the tools that are uh, useful for scaling up your resistance things like tome of warding don't necessarily scale up your defense at all and so a way that you can utilize this is actually switching into a materium transformation to add physical damage because if your opponent has 14 resistance because they have like bolster resistance 5 but they only have 8 
eight defense, then as it, adding physical damage to your breath weapon on like turn 40 or 50 or whatever can actually be a really, really big upgrade on your, your dragon's damage output. And a 70% chance of inflicting a relatively rare type of stun is good. You don't want to be stacking too many of the same type of uh, stuns. In fact, you mostly don't want to be doing that at all because you're just not going to be getting nearly as much value. But Gilded is a rare form of stun, and therefore if you have like a, a Shadow Dragon, for instance, with a frozen breath weapon and a guild, then you get rolls on both of those on the same breath weapon attack, which can dramatically increase your ability to, to, to do some stuns down. Um, and I think actually that's part of the value for the Astral Transformation too. They get access to a 70% chance of inflicting stunned as part of their gen generic breath weapon. Uh, I think overall I do think that they're very very close between those two I think because lightning damage uh, is is still very powerful towards the end of the game if you wanted to put astral transformation above materium I wouldn't blame you um, but I do think that more people are going to have the tools to resist lightning damage on turn you know 40 or whatever uh, than they are going to to have tools to resist tons of physical damage unless they're playing as industrious um, and stunned is a more common form of of uh, stunning um, than Gilded, and of course Gilded does give you a little bit of gold towards the end, um, so I think those are, are pretty close. And then of course this does give you the Ethereal unit type. Now this is not pure upside uh, in this universe because minus four lightning re resistance is actually a big a big deal, um, and a lot of the same sort of permanent status immunities that Materium gets access to, because they turn your dragon into an elemental, you're also getting access to uh, through the ethereal tag, and, and vice versa, um, but critically, Materium, this does apply to um, uh, Eternal Earth on the Tome of the Creator, which is pretty good in auto-resolve, like being able to bring your dragon back is not and not as big a deal, but fortunately you don't have to spend a, a, a hero point on it, you just have to research it in your tier 5. Uh, but the plus 2 physical defense on Ethereal is pretty good, just be aware that like this comes with a meaningful cost in terms of, of extra electric damage coming in. The nature and the shadow transformations are a little worse for a couple of reasons. So first, uh, the shadow transformation, you get a frozen breath weapon. If you're already playing with a shadow dragon, then that is like a huge non-bow. The inflicts to weakened is a pretty powerful uh, part and in, of the shadow transformation itself and actually does help bolster it a lot. Um, but unfortunately, it does give you the undead unit type and the minus four spirit and fire resistance on your, your ruler means that all of a sudden your your ruler is a lot more likely to get absolutely dumpstered by an opponent who knows what's up. Um, and the undead unit type, it's it's still getting buffed, and so hopefully in the future we can evaluate Shadow Transformation as being a little a little stronger. But like right now, if people notice that your you know your dragon is an undead um, and they kill it and they don't want you to bring them back with a necromancer, they'll just stand on you. Uh, and then and then if you kill that guy, then their dead guy will be on top of your dragon. So then you need two corpse uh, manipulations just to to get down to your dragon. It it's unfortunate, but it is true that I, I just don't think you're going to take Shadow very often. Um, and then the Nature Transformation, I think, is in similar spot. Like, the, the plant unit type is mostly bad. You don't get any stun here. This is part Blight damage, inflicting Decaying and Poisoned. And unfortunately for Nature Transformation here, Decaying and Poisoned are, like, two of the most commonly resisted uh, statuses in the game, and they don't do anything to slow your opponent's damage output out, other than just killing them. And two Regeneration to Friendly units hit is a lot worse than removing uh, like all status eff effects in 25 healing. So like you basically do not need nature transformation uh, almost ever unless you, unless you're specifically using the the tier five um, the tier five nature tome force of nature plus 20 percent crit chance and then uh, materium and tome of the golden realm gilded magic makes crits uh, with a magic attack inflict gilded for one turn and of course your breath weapon is a magic attack so like all of those things do work together um in order to to get your dragon some some value out of that signature skill but it's only some value and then unfortunately the chaos transformation is just, just 
poo poo. Fire damage is a bad damage type. It's up there with uh, blight damage as a being generically not very good. Um, the demonkin unit type is like cute, but mostly not where you want to be because getting extra spirit weakness is like a very dangerous thing to do in this this game uh, at the moment. And then the fact that it's a 60% chance of inflicting a random negative status effect as opposed to a 70% chance of inflicting a stun is usually bad. Like you, you might remember the time that you did inflict somebody with insanity and it was really good, but overall chaos transformation is just incredibly random in terms of its value and not very powerful. Now, that said, we are on to our main uh, our main affair here, which are the regular signature skills. Even on a Dragon Ruler, you're going to see these on level 8 and level 16, but all the other ones we're going to see like at 4, 8, 12, and 16, and so when and how you're going to be picking them and how we're going to evaluate them is going to be a, a, a big deal here. But as I mentioned, we are going to sort these into affinity, so I think what we're going to do is we're just going to start with uh, pr probably probably chaos because it's the one that's furthest to the left right now um, and then we'll just drop them in right here all right so for our chaos affinity signature skills the first thing that we need to recall is that the chaos affinity is not particularly important for our empire tree and so this is more meant towards like basic heroes than it is meant towards your ruler but some of these effects are still very powerful and do have some good use cases so in the a tier we've dropped in assassinate assassinate is a very powerful free action it's a lot better in manual combats than it is in auto resolves but that said it's still not bad in auto resolves because it's a free action that can potentially kill kill. It's a free action that can potentially kill that does a lot better uh, if you can if you can get killing momentum on a, a hero early, and so generally speaking I think assassinate is one of those things that you're going to take a lot more as like a level 8 or a level 12 on a, a hero than it is as a level 4, but even at the very beginning of the game being able to take free actions to kill things is very strong, because um, even without killing momentum, if you're successful on the assassinate and then you know turn around and, and still have the movement to charge in with your lance and kill somebody else that can be really good for your auto resolve um, and it doesn't really hurt you in any way because of the free action thing the biggest way that I've seen assassinate hurt people is that it can make your uh, ranged units get into melee and so like generally don't put assassinate on a unit that isn't going to have some sort of melee attack but pistol and sword has a melee attack and a gun so like that's pretty good for assassinates and and for everything else um and so it, i think it's a pretty reasonable place to start uh demon step if we were looking at things from a purely manual combat perspective then i think demon step could easily be an s tier the unfortunate thing for demon step is that it is a teleport and the way that the ai uses teleports right now is unhinged they are lunatics the number of times I've seen them like take a hero with a staff and, and blink and like run forward and then blink behind the enemy army and then take like one shot with a staff at a flank attack against a, a shield wall and then get slaughtered on the retaliation is through the roof and so demon step is very dangerous to take in an auto resolve scenario and I think that's the biggest problem with it right here um in a manual combat this is a fantastic ability because any Thing that allows you to do a teleport even if it's only leaving one these days and so like there are a lot more restrictions in terms of like how you can use your teleports and your moment your movement abilities in manual combats these are probably the two best uh in the game but because it has a, a fantastic ability to get your your heroes very very slaughtered in auto resolves um and like you can reset into this right before a manual fight so you don't have to carry demon step the entire time you can just pick it up at the very end i think b makes sense and then reckless Rage, I could I could make an, an argument for this to go all the way down to D tier, honestly, because it is pretty bad. Um, but it does have a lot of interesting synergies, simply because Reckless Rage is plus 30% melee damage for three turns, and that is its own tag, right? So that is something where it is a unique ability uh, that stacks in addition to things like Strengthened and Fortune and all that jazz. And if you use it on a, a hero who's going to have a lot of ability to do tons of melee damage, like somebody with a lance and um, you know, like a teleport and killing momentum and stuff like that you can really get a lot of damage out of reckless rage but you need ways to counter the sunder defense and resistance i think the easiest way around that is to like typically have access to tome of alchemy um because the the ai will use all of those tools relatively well together but it's 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 pretty bad like you you really do need to have um free actions that are clearing those debuffs this can make your your killing momentum uh melee lancers really pop off. 
So when it comes to our astral signature skills here, I have a hard time not giving these guys just great grades across the board. They're all fantastic whenever it comes to the economy that they generate for you, because astral affinity is, is useful for you on a ruler or a governor. Um, but more importantly, since the abilities are very good, uh, unfortunately, Blink is going to be our A tier. I do think that in manual combats, Blink is probably one of the strongest skills in the game, if not the strongest skill in the game. But in auto resolves, just as with uh, Demon Step, where you you can get your hero dead in a hurry by giving them access to a teleportation and no friends who can do that teleportation. Blink is the same thing. This is a lot less dangerous in a universe where you have access to uh, like unicorn mounted bastions, so do be aware that that can definitely bring this thing up. Um, the more extra mobility that you have going around, the less it is like absolutely suicidal to give it to just your heroes. But on its own, if in an auto resolve situation with absolutely nothing else, What's going on this can be pretty dangerous but the other two um astrals are fantastic no matter what you're doing whether it's auto resolve or manual combat due to a change to accuracy so it used to be that visions of woe was one of these things that was like amazing in auto resolves but su suffered a lot in manual because people would do a lot to just stack their crit chance into outer space and it used to be that the crit would check before the fumble and if the crit was successful the fumble would automatically fail but now they've reversed those things so now visions of woe inflicting um, a one hex radius to automatically fumble for an entire turn on an enemy is a really big deal in manual combat and even in auto resolve this can save your bacon big time because the ai just like wanders units at each other like hulk smash and that is exactly what this thing interacts favorably with it uses this ability on two or more enemy units most of the time it's a great aoe exploiter and a lot of combat between the the auto resolve ai is about exploiting AoE and punishing the enemy for clumping too many units together. If you get three automatic fumbles on an enemy and they want to attack you, you're going to have a hell of a counterattack next turn. Um, and I think that that means that because of the, the accuracy changes, I think this is an S tier. It's, it's very, very solid. In a universe where everyone has status immunity rings, that's obviously worse. And so like this thing does drop off as the, the game goes on, but it's still very powerful. And then Mana Unchained is just sort of like a bang the entire game in my opinion um, so first it's gonna give you three star blades that is the same ability as the the mystics but this is just an enormous amount of magical damage that you get to add to the board the biggest downside to mana unchained and I think you know like one argument to maybe pushing it lower is that this is contextual based off of how many units you have at the beginning of the game if you manage to keep all of your army alive then uh, get mana unchained is obviously a lot better um, whereas if all of your units keep dying Dying over and over and over again then obviously that's worse because this benefits you a lot to have a full six stack if you're going into like an ancient wonder or whatever but part of the value of, of mana unchained is that even in like very early game resource clearing fights and stuff buffs are things that the ai is pretty proactive at using um they're not perfect that you know like m moving units around and making sure that it gets on all of them all at once blah 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 blah, blah. It, it's not a perfect ai but it will try to use buffs and heals very early and very proactively and that will weight up those skills simply because like they, the auto resolve can't not use them um, and this is a giant amount of damage three star blades and two strengthened at the beginning of the game when you're fighting against a bunch of units that have like three defense and zero resistance is an insane upgrade in terms of your clearing um, and then even when it comes to like pvp mana unchained is disgusting on a on a sufficiently powerful unit and you can use this on your heroes in addition to everybody else like great in manual combat great in auto resolve so i think uh, towards the top of s makes sense for man unchanged just be aware that like you do need units in order for that thing to really pop off all right, so up next we have our Shadow Affinity uh, signature skills. So we have the Dark Ritual in the S tier. In our B tier, we have Summon Undead. And in our C tier, we have Draining Blade. Now, Summon Undead in B tier might horrify and, and shock some of you into unsubscribing. But the fact of the matter is that in auto resolves, summoning is a lot worse because the AI is not particularly good at like trying to prioritize when to use a, a summon at all. I've, I cannot tell you how many fights in auto resolve I've watched where like the 
AI has access to a summon through either like summon undead or like a bell of spider calling and just literally never use it in the entire combat. Um, and so if you're talking about a signature skill, which in yes, in manual combats, summons are very good, but in, in auto resolves against the board, you're like kind of taking a coin flip in terms of the summons actually like coming out and providing value. Um, and then even when you do so, when you get to the point where it, yes, this thing is coming out and, and rocking and rolling, you're going to have some issues in manual combats where like you're going to become the AI and realize that you just don't need to ever use your summon undead because now you're in a combat where you have nine tier threes on one side and 12 on the other and like one more tier three is not actually worth an entire action out of your hero because your hero is now at the point where it can do so much damage that it can kill an entire tier three in one action and like what well, well what's the value of doing another unit that's just gonna like play you know slap around instead of just removing all of your opponent's units so it's not that summons aren't good it's that summons are a lot better in manual combats than they are in in uh, auto resolves so you do need to factor that into your into the way that you're going to assess things here the more summoning um that you're going to be doing the harder you're going to have a, a time in auto resolve now that said we did put dark ritual which is like sort of the premier summon here at towards the top in our s tier why is that how is that walker you just you just said summoning isn't great well two reasons one dark ritual is going to add multiple units even in an auto resolve situation adding multiple units out of a dark ritual is actually a very powerful tool um and more importantly here in uh auto resolve land is that this is a six range full action magic attack yes it's not perfect if dark ritual is used exclusively to do a little bit of damage as a fireball as people are moving in but i'd much rather have the hero use a skill that does a little bit of low damage frost fireball than a skill that they just like literally do not use all game because the game is too shy about using summonings um and then in a manual combat situation dark ritual is outrageous i would say dark ritual is up there with blank in terms of like competition and maybe mass rejuvenation in terms of competition for like one of the strongest uh signature skills in the game because if you can do a dark ritual and like eat your opponent's phoenix or something like that you are gonna turn combats on their head and and then there are other situations where like there is no phoenix but there's just three bodies laying on the ground and the action economy of adding three decaying zombies out of one action from your hero which isn't even prevented by zone of control problems is really really good dark ritual is a fantastic ability um it is it is typically a little bit better in in manuals than it is in autos but unlike stuff like uh blank and demon step which can like actively get your hero killed accidentally dark ritual's downside is that like the ai is just too happy to use it for tiny amounts of damage and so you don't get nearly as many units out of it but even that's not bad um and then draining blade is mostly taken primarily for the affinity in the event that you desperately need shadow affinity it's not bad if you're doing a lot of melee damage stacking so do be aware of that because it does have this tag so like i think that's where you can justify taking it um but mostly if you're taking this you're taking it on your ruler because you need the shadow affinity uh or because there's like literally nothing else that you're actually interested in on your on your hero in question um but overall like it yes this can do a bunch of damage with a single action uh but it's just it's just not enough in comparison to something like dark ritual to to be excited about all right, so next we have our Materium Affinity Signature Skills. Now, important to note that if you're playing around with your ruler's signature skills, this is definitely one of the cases where you can just like take your thumb and put it over the skill and it doesn't really matter what the skill does, it matters that it gives you the affinity for your empire. But when it comes to your, your heroes themselves, I do think the Materium Affinity Signature Skills are like one of the worst parts of the Materium package, which is I think totally fine because like they're pretty good otherwise. Um, Summon Elemental is I think the best of the summons so that is going to be uh, in, up, up here in our B tier. And then in the C tier, we have Frostfire Detonation and Warding Bond. I've kind of arranged them inside of their, their tiers, but do understand that because there's also Dragon Skills in here, uh, these are not as, as granular as some of the other uh, tier lists, because you really can't compare like a, an order aspect to a Summon ele uh, Undead. Those do very different things. Um, but Summon Elemental is, I think, the best of the, the summons, simply because the Elementals are going to be 
be single model entities. That means that any of the damage that they take, unlike the damage coming to your uh, summon undead, is not going to reduce their damage uh, output themselves. And some of the effects that you get here are really nice, like a snow spirit has a 90% chance to freeze, um, the stone spirit can defend your other guys, storm spirits like rock all over ranged units because of their wind barrier as well as their teleport, tide spirits can also do a lot of damage with their tidal wave, and then magma spirits are fantastic as is tides at exploiting AoE opportunities. And so like everything that you get there in the, the elemental package is really good, except for one weird thing, the more elemental stuff that you are personally doing already in your build the less you probably want summon elemental like if you're already rocking with snow spirits that you've evolved then summon elemental is a lot worse simply because you can accidentally roll a magma spirit at which point the burning that you're getting off of magma spirit will counter the snow spirit so like that's not great um but i think overall summon elemental is a very very powerful option for someone who wants a materium affinity the other two choices aren't as good um frostfire detonations big thing is that it is a a gigantic AOE magic attack and so if you can do something to get like gilding on crits um, then Frostfire Detonation is obviously very powerful there because if you can do a two AOE automatic guild in a gigantic range because this is just all that would ask you to do is crit uh, and this is an auto hit and then and then the crit will supply the guild then Frostfire Detonation is good um, outside of those scenarios where you have like a very specific magical buff for your hero that it is applying on top of the Frostfire Detonation. Outside of scenarios like that, you're mostly not gonna be taking this for anything other than the affinity. Um, but sometimes in the very beginning of the game, it can be it can be fine to take a Frostfire Detonation if you don't see anything else that's like particularly useful. And you have very big problems where you're like mostly melee, but also don't have haste. If you're mostly melee, but also don't have haste, then you need to seriously consider some sort of a uh, big long range magical attack like Frostfire Detonation, because otherwise you're not gonna have a way to force people to come to you and uh, your troops are gonna get chewed up walking in. Warding Bond is supposed to kind of help there, and I do think that it's actually not bad once you start getting a lot of extra heroes stacked together, so that way the different heroes can like use Warding Bond on each other, but unfortunately in Auto Resolve it's not very good. I think in Manual Combat, uh, Warding Bond is actually meaningfully better. Uh, exactly how much better does depend a lot on what sort of army composition you're running, because I think that Warding Bond really does reward you the most for having like extra beyond three heroes, and that's typically not the way that we, that we play on on our channel um depends a lot like right now because of the imperium cost it's pretty expensive to have more than three heroes anyway um but i think when you when you once you start getting into that realm then warding bond can be good because there can be a lot of tools for heroes to keep themselves alive to have lots of ways for them to do damage resistance uh and then then they can be really disgusting because if you can keep one hero in the front on like a killing momentum murder spree and then somebody on the back keeping that killing momentum murder spree guy alive uh you don't need to worry nearly as much about flanking attacks if your hp pool is like effectively plus one and a half extra heroes so warding bond can be good there but that's a very late game thing and i think early game auto resolve just like does not use it particularly well so c me c makes sense to me all right, so up next we have our order uh, signature skills. In the S tier, we have Rallying Blessing. In the C tier, we have Restoration. And in the D tier, we have Holy Retribution. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Rallying Blessing. Now, I do wanna mention, of course, that like the affinity is probably the biggest thing holding Rallying Blessing back. I think if you wanted to make an argument for it in the A tier, I think you could, I think you could persuade me. Um, but I do think that the ability here is very strong, especially because of the way the, the auto resolve AI will behave. So the auto resolve AI loves using buffs and heals it loves those sorts of effects. It has a lot of issues with um, resurrection things, which is going to reflect the grade on restoration, but just like across the board buffs and heals, the AI is very, very proactive at using, um, and so anything like this is going to be very good. But Rallying Blessing is even better, simply because the rally ability will add morale, which will stick with your units throughout the course of the entire combat, not just the first three turns, uh, which is what defense and, and resistance bolstering will do. This is just going to mod modify 
by up your morale on all your guys uh, that that it hits. The biggest thing I guess against Rallying Blessing is that its its affinity type is pretty bad. Um, but this is just a fantastic good uh, tempo play for your your AI to have access to. And even in manual combats, I think Rallying Blessing is still very good. It obviously benefits a lot from interactions with things like Industrious or uh, Tome of Mists, other ways to just like keep your uh, these stacks of things refreshed on terms of their their timer. Because the more that you can refresh those those timers, like the the better that this becomes. But this is three really powerful bonuses in a universe where like those those sorts of effects are generally rarer than getting a bunch of, of strengthened. And so I, I think Rallying Blessing does deserve a slot in the S tier. Restoration, unfortunately, in C suffers a lot from the AI just like not really understanding how to use resurrection or dispel effects particularly well. Um, I think if this wasn't once per battle or if it was only one action, uh, then like the auto resolve could probably get a little better value out of it. But like I, I've literally seen combats where the AI had access to restoration, a unit died and it just refused to use it the entire combat. And then at the end of the combat, the like because the the game doesn't just use the restoration magically at the end of combat, you're down an enemy, you're down a unit and uh you had a way to, to get out of it. Like is that is that really actually worse than a skill that is a skill that you didn't use worse than a different skill that you didn't use, Walker? Well, probably not, but it's definitely more tilting to have a restoration that, like, a, a, a dead unit and then not have it happen versus have a dead unit and then just have a, an unused uh, summon undead because, like, you're not going to yell at your computer as much. Um, but, like, realistically, I think restoration offers you pretty bad value in terms of its affinity as well as, like, problems with the, the AI not using it particularly well. Holy Retribution, at least the AI, like, can't not use it well and so like maybe it should deserve a spot up in the c tier maybe maybe it should deserve a spot up in the c tier but maybe we should just use move reckless rage down to d instead um yeah that that looks a little better i think holy retribution has problems where like it doesn't do a lot for you in auto resolve simply because a bunch of units are going to have some amount of resistance on them and five spirit damage is just not a lot this will do like three or four damage in retaliation sometimes um and more importantly is that in manual combats this does absolutely nothing because in manual combats your opponent is going to notice that you have holy retribution and then just like ignore that hero because it's not very threatening because you said you spent a signature skill on getting your opponent to ignore you um and that that really is kind of like all it does there all right, last but not least, that leaves us with our nature signature skills. So here at the top of the S tier, we have our mass rejuvenation. I think that especially in regards to auto resolve, this is inarguably, especially the first copy of uh, mass rejuvenation is inarguably like your best signature skill because your first copy of mass rejuvenation essentially makes like all clearing on the map uh, effectively free in terms of damage as long as your unit survives. Because in the event that your unit is alive um, and and in the combat and has like at least 10 hit points at the beginning of combat or whatever, it's gonna get 10 extra hit points from the Master Rejuvenation targeting it. It's gonna get one stack of regeneration. That stack of regeneration will of course interact really favorably with things like restore, but it'll also just interact favorably with itself because it'll trigger at the end of your own turn. So mass rejuvenation is effectively like minimum heal 16 on all of your units on the first turn of, of combat. And then because like the, a the auto resolve AI will sometimes spend a turn or two just doing a uh, jockeying for position, sometimes mass rejuvenation is really more like heal 24 on all of your units at the beginning of combat that's obviously like a lot better whenever you have damaged units um and so it is something that goes up and down in comparison to some of the other s tiers simply because if you don't have a lot of damaged units um then something like mana unchained or visions or even rallying blessing is probably going to provide more value to you but if you're in a manual combat against like your opponent and your opponent has a blizzard in your hand and you have a mass rejuvenation on the board if they blizzard you you can heal all of that damage back with one uh mass rejuvenation even on on three stacks if you're careful about moving it around and even in an auto resolve situation it's just fantastic at tempo generally you don't need more than one of these that is the biggest problem with mass rejuvenation and definitely could be a reason to push it de further down on the uh the tier list here but i think it's very powerful and, and people should play around with it more um but the first copy of mass rejuvenation in your sixth stack with your ruler and uh like your first
first or second hero is amazing in terms of how how much speed it opens up to you in terms of map clearing. Um, in the B tier, we also have the summon animal. Summon animal, as we mentioned with other summons, I, I think that this is generically a little bit worse than um, summon elemental, simply because like the usability of some of these units is not particularly high. But there there's some pretty big deltas. Like the unicorn can do a lot of damage with a, that phase ability. Um, Caustic worm can do a lot of damage to yourself if you if you click the uh, the caustic eruption, hoping to see where it will affect the board, and instead by clicking this, it doesn't reveal to you where it'll it'll use it. It'll just use it. You know, summon an animal isn't going to be bad for you. It's just that it, it largely isn't going to be as productive as as elementals because these guys are a little more fragile in terms of being multi multi unit models. And then uh, virulent outbreak we have dropped down in the D tier. So virulent outbreak unfortunately has a lot of problems where first it is not a magic tag so that means it does not get access to ignoring status resistance on magic attacks which is a, a big thing whenever it, it comes to, to getting value out of those sorts of effects uh, like frostfire detonation on your on your mage that that can be really good but here it's a debuff so it's just a base 90 um, now air quotes around just but this means that as the game goes on virulent outbreak will go lower and lower and lower in terms of its value you can use this at the very beginning in a big big fight with like a bunch of tier ones on one side and a bunch of tier ones on the other side to do a lot of damage um, but poisoned one stack is just not going to do enough in terms of offensive pro uh, production and then diseased is resisted by a relatively large pool of, of different types of units as well as being something that doesn't do any damage on its own it, it just reduces the resistance and therefore offers you more, more opportunities to exploit but i think overall virulent outbreak is just not particularly powerful all right so that is our signature skills tier list here on we play games uh that is live as of the uh, the wolf patch now I, I was planning on doing uh our stream with crimson caldera today but i like did not record this until today pretty obviously because i was playing endless space 2 uh we'll see I, I might stream like all day tomorrow we'll we'll figure it out but i want to get this thing edited and out uh, oh and like and subscribe for for more content and, and click on end reels or whatever it is that do whatever call to action speaks best to, to your soul. That's that is uh, that's Walker here on We Play Games. All right, take care.